Welcome to this introduction to Listening to Indigenous Voices, a Dialogue Guide on Justice and Right Relationships. My name is Mark Hathaway, and I was a member of the editorial team that created this guide at the Jesuit Forum for Social Faith and Justice. To begin, I'd like to just give a bit of background about this guide. It's 112 pages long, and it was created in response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and published by Novalis Press in 2020 in both English and French. The guide was created by an editorial team made up of both Indigenous and non-Indigenous persons, but the contents of the guide really are mainly created by Indigenous authors and artists who gave us permission to use their writings and pieces of artwork for which we're very grateful. The process of creating the guide was overseen by an advisory circle, once again, made up of both Indigenous and non-Indigenous persons. And while this written guide is 112 pages long, there are also many resources available on the two supporting websites, both in English and French. The addresses are provided here. The basic rationale of this guide is that this part of Turtle Island that we call Canada does not so much have an indigenous problem. We don't have an indigenous problem. We have a colonization problem. And we need to deal with this colonization problem if we are really going to move toward authentic reconciliation and right relationships. And a first step really is to listen deeply to Indigenous voices, to understand Indigenous worldviews, to understand the history of colonization from the perspective of Indigenous persons. So this is a guide for listening to those voices, but also engaging with them in what we call a listening circle or dialogue circle approach, where each of us shares from our own experience to foster an authentic change of heart or metanoia. The first part of the guide begins by trying to look at Indigenous worldviews. And of course, there's a wide diversity of Indigenous cultures in Turtle Island. This first session looks at creation stories, beginnings. In English, an Anishinaabe creation story. In French, an Abenaki creation story. Both of those stories are presented as videos to underline in part the importance of oral tradition. It's very different listening to a story than reading a story. There's also a piece in this session on some background of the histories of the peoples of Abiyayala, uh, that is the indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere. Just to give some context around uh, the history the long history of Indigenous peoples on these continents and how colonization has affected that. Session two considers a tale of two communities to begin to look at how there is a deep injustice in this part of Turtle Island that we call Canada. And it begins with the story of the Oneida Nation of the Timms near London, Ontario, a community right across the street uh, from drinkable water, and yet a community which itself does not have safe drinking water, even though they're very close to a major urban center. There's also a piece by Art Manuel, the first of several in the guide, uh, Art Manuel is a wonderful uh, uh, writer 
who passed away several years ago. And here he reflects on colonization, racism, and injustice. There's also some pieces on exploring stereotypes in media and some key statistics around uh, Indigenous peoples in Canada, which demonstrate the situation of injustice that many are living. Session three then picks up on themes around Indigenous worldviews, in particular the land, beginning with a piece by Jeanette Armstrong on how the land is us. Uh, Jeanette Armstrong is an Okanagan uh, Indigenous person. There's also a piece by Robin Wall Kimmerer on land as a source of belonging or of belongings. How do we see land? How do we understand land? There's a beautiful version of the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving Address by John Mohawk, uh, which can also be read collectively, which really helps us develop a sense of gratitude for the land as a living community, as well as some pieces on land acknowledgements. Session four looks at the importance of Indigenous languages in this session called Languages of the Land. John Burroughs has a beautiful piece on language as animate and how it connects to the land. Um, a piece by David Begay on connection, motion, and life, how in many Indigenous cosmologies have a, and languages have a much more active verbal sense which creates a different way of perceiving the world. There's also some pieces on linguistic diversity, particularly looking at British Columbia, which is probably the area of this part of Turtle Island with the greatest linguistic diversity. Session five looks at treaties as ties of kinship. Treaties in most Indigenous cultures are not understood in the same way as Europeans have traditionally understood treaties. Nigan Sinclair begins with this piece on ties of kinship, followed by another piece by Sylvia McAdam looking at a treaty between the Nihewopya and Siksika nations, where they actually exchange their children in order to guarantee a treaty. So treaties have a deep sense of relationship and sacredness. There's also pieces on the dish with one spoon, wampum, which is perhaps one of the best known treaties around the Great Lakes area, uh, the two row wampum, and a piece by Michael Ash, where he demonstrates that none of the oral Indigenous treaties made with settlers actually seat at land. There's no seat at land in this part of Turtle Island. Session six then shifts to begin to look at the history of colonization. In this session on early encounters, which would encompass the time certainly up to about the end of the 1700s, uh, it begins by looking at the doctrine of discovery, drawing on a number of different sources. One of those is a piece by Sylvia McAdam where she refers to the doctrine of discovery as fairy dust. And while the doctrine of discovery certainly had to do with an early church proclamation, the important thing here is to understand how it has become embedded in our legal frameworks and how it continues to have an ongoing legacy today. There's also a piece here on the early fur trade, as well as on some of the early missionaries, particularly the Jesuit mission in Midland, Ontario, and two pieces on two of the early treaties, one, the Great Peace of Montreal, and the second, uh, perhaps not well known to many of us, most of us have heard of the Royal Proclamation, but probably even more important is this early Treaty of Niagara, which in some ways differs from some of the latter treaties between 
settlers and indigenous peoples. Session seven may be one of the most challenging. It looks at the history of the Indian Act and residential schools in this session called Killing the Indian in the Child. As I say, uh, looking at the history and legacy of Indian residential schools can be particularly painful, but also understanding the Indian Act as an instrument of colonization and control. There's a piece on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the idea of cultural genocide, as well as a piece on the 60s scoop, Inuit relocations and child labor in sugar beet farms. So really looking at that period, probably from about the mid 1800s through to the 1960s and the history of colonization here in this part of Turtle Island. Session eight looks at the more modern manifestations of colonization in this session called Dispossession, Dependency and Oppression, which begins with a piece by Art Manuel focused on how those three aspects entwine to continue colonization today. There's a piece by Cora Morgan on the child welfare system, a piece on the missing and murdered Indigenous women's and girls report, and a piece by Beverly Jacobs on decolonizing the violence against Indigenous women. In session nine, we shift from that history of colonization to look ahead. How can we move beyond apologies. The session begins with a piece by Lee Maracle on to forgive or to change, really asking what forgiveness, apologies, what do they really mean? How can we go beyond words to authentic change? Elder Kroshu writes about the importance as well of reconciliation with the natural world. John Borrows on forgiveness as a warming of relationships. And I have a piece there about moving from denial to transformation from the perspective of a settler. How can we move beyond denial to authentic transformation? How can we untie the cords of past mistakes, of past hurts, to a new relationship, one built on genuine respect and care. Session 10 then explores pathways to decolonization beginning with a piece once again by Art Manuel about some concrete steps that could be taken to move toward a post-colonial Canada, a post-colonial state on this part of Turtle Island. There's a piece on what it means to be a good ally, a piece on the United Nations uh, Declarations on the Right of Indigenous Peoples, and a beautiful piece by Nikki Sanchez on decolonization is for everyone, which is also available on the website as a video. The final session is about re-indigenization or indigenization. What does indigenization mean? Well, Gregory uh, Cajete uh, begins with a piece on that. And then there's other pieces on what does it mean to live well, uh, a piece by Rowan White on receding relationships, a piece by Robin Wall Kimmerer on becoming indigenous or naturalized to place. Those of us who are settlers and newcomers perhaps cannot become indigenous to place, but can we become naturalized like 
the common plantain plant. And then there's also a piece as well by Glenn Guthart on the Lichenta Bush University as a concrete example of indigenization. Throughout the guide, in each session, we provide pieces which we call classroom connections. And these are pieces developed particularly as curriculum pieces for secondary schools, uh, probably primarily grade 10, 11, and 12. Things like learning about one's local sacred places, exploring contemporary indigenous music. There's an activity called the house uh, to try to understand how uh, land was taken, but also the violation of treaties, a classroom debate on the doctrine of discovery, writing a letter on daily life in an Indian residential school, a tableau of Inuit uh, relocations, how art is used as resistance, uh, the whole image of the Norse chair, which was used by Lee Maracle in session nine to think about cultural violence, and also trying to imagine what a post or decolonized Canada might actually look like. Finally, I just wish to note that we also provide a series of spiritual reflections, which can be downloaded online. They're not in the written guide, but they are available online. And these are from a variety of different spiritual perspectives, including different Christian denominations, uh, Muslim and indigenous spiritual traditions. And they provide additional questions that can be used in listening circles. To conclude this video, I just want to underline once again that this guide is not just something to read, it's something to engage with. It's something to work with in a group, to work for a genuine change of heart through that listening circle or dialogue circle process. And finally, I would like to say that once we do finish the guide, I think it's the call of each of us to find concrete ways of working for decolonization and writing relationships between settlers, newcomers, and indigenous peoples. For those of us who are settlers or newcomers, that means becoming good and respectful allies. It might mean other ways of building relationship because I think ultimately uh, that is the challenge to reimagine and rebuild relationships. It's a long journey. I wish all of you well, and thank you so much for listening to this video.